Joanne? Yeah, so I wanted to come at it from a different place, which is uh, going back to Tiffany's point. All of the men and women in this room can, in fact, do more than come to events where we all feel good about ourselves. We can actually help two, three, four other people raise their sights. So I'll give you two pieces of data. One from this uh, large survey that we did. 36% of the men who were in entry and mid-level positions and only 18% of the women in those same positions aspired to get to the top. We also interviewed about 200 women from these 60 companies who were considered to be very successful at the director level and 41% of them wanted to get to the top. So we still can do better in helping women understand what their sites can be. Your point is not enough want to get to mm -hmm. the top. Well, and they're not even aware that there is a place for them there. So sometimes it's just informational and a little bit of motivation and inspiration that you can, in fact, get there and it's not gonna crash your world if you did aspire and you did stand up to be counted. So throw your hat in the ring and get rejected five times. What's, what's one time? Nothing. Get up again. Yeah. Question in the back. Joanna, you stole my question. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Amanda. So, my actual question was, what can I individually do at the beginning of my career, and what can we see women in you know, later stages of their career actually do to raise their hand and get on the board? Because I'm hearing you know, kind of a lot of what institutionally we can do, but individually, like, do I need P&L responsibility? Do I need to be more comfortable with risks? I clearly need to be better at networking and getting in front of the right people. But like, what does that path look like for me? Like, what do I have to do to fight to get there? Nels, what's the spec? <laughs> yeah. um, well, it's, it's, it's a number of the things that you mentioned, absolutely. Uh, and we've talked about sponsorship and mentorship and such. Uh, I also believe that, again, um, there are only so many spots in the Fortune 500, even if we've, we've gone through the numbers. Um, and there are some fabulous companies, wh whether it's in the private equity side or whether they're small or mid-cap mid mid companies where uh, you can gain great experience. Um, it, I, I just think at the, at the end of the day, I think, again, you have to stay focused on this and, um, and make sure that um, as you go through your career that you are, uh, um, that you are building relationships with people um, that are on boards that can give you practical advice. And then really, it, it, uh, as I said before, even in the Fortune 500, half of those uh, half of those searches are done by the committee themselves, and it's refer it's through a referral. So it's letting people know that you're willing to you're willing and able to, to serve. Uh, but cert but in the beginning of one's career, they have to you know put a brick in the wall every day in terms of your own uh, expertise and your own um, uh, breadth of experience. Well, it's a great question if we think about the young person starting to think about what's that experience base I've got to build. You know, just, just this past week, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of Title IX. So thanks to that great 37 words written into legislation 40 years ago, we now have over half of our college graduates to be women, and we now have over half of the American workforce to be women. And we still have this issue at the top. So, you know, check, we celebrate Title IX, and yet 40 years later, we got a, we got a problem at the top. Then we have this Atlantic article by Anne Marie Slaughter that says why women still can't have it all, which was focused on the top and the issues that you know still face face women in particular. And her hypothesis was, you know, to close the gender gap, do we have to close the leadership gap? In other words, do we gotta, do we have to get more women on boards so that the policies that will help keep women in the workplace will start to change because they aren't changing fast enough. Panel, what do you th what do you think about that combination of we celebrate Title IX. We got the, the cover page of the Atlantic, why women still can't have it all. I, I, I take a very different look. There are hundreds of thousands of women in entry level positions that Amanda's talking about. If they were to stay in the line, get, as Nels is saying, breadth of experience, including international experience, before having children, so when it's fun to work 80 hours a week <laughs> and travel around the world, they will, in fact, connect better. Some of us are afraid to do that. You're not, Amanda, I know. But, in fact, teaching people how to connect, how to do that in a, a corporate world of transactions, teaching people how to take risk. We're not betting banks here. We're taking risks, should I take this job or that job? So these are risks that you can fail at and be okay. That will already go a long way, and within 
five years time by adding seats to the table, by having CEOs reach down and start to pull people through, you can really change the picture. Very well said. Um, I should have talked to you before I started out my career because I obviously <laughs> did it backwards. But uh, regardless, I think there are other things that women can do. Um, and I think part of it was brought out by the article and part of it was uh, is probably very well exemplified when Sheryl Sandberg said that she um, left work at 5.30 every night to have dinner with her family. And there was this wonderful interview with her where she shared that her best friend said to her she couldn't have gotten more media coverage from that than if she said she just murdered someone. Because <laughs> there was so much uproar and coverage over the fact that she leaves work at 5.30 every night to have dinner with her family. Um, I do think that there is an additional responsibility, if you will, for women to share things like that. Um, I when, when I, I do travels quite a bit for my job, uh, but when I'm home, I have dinner with my family, uh, with my with my children every night, uh, and that's something that I feel the responsibility that I need to share, that I need to make sure that people in my office, my colleagues, my clients, that they know that because I think that that sort of helps welcome the environment. Oh, okay, I get it. This is how you can do it. This is how you can continue to climb up the ladder but still maintain you know your um, your your family life and, and the lives of your children so um, I think that's something else that women of all no matter what point you are at your career can and should do thank you, you. Can I, can I add something to that Please. you are benefited by having an enlightened CEO <laughs> <laughs> yes um, you know I, I can tell you from my experience until you get a board or a management team that is, pick a number, 25, 30% women, the discussion doesn't change enough. Mm -hmm. And there's not enough focus on issues of flexibility that you just highlighted, mm -hmm. such that Cheryl saying we're going to go home at 5.30, and <coughs> highly likely she's working from 9 until midnight or something. As we all are. Yes. But, you know, issues of changing the organization culture so that FaceTime is not the measure of how hard someone's working, but what they produce is what's a measure of how, how effective they are. All these things get a different lens when you have 25 or 30% of your leadership team being women. Mm -hmm. If it's one woman on a board of 15 right. people or 14, 13 people, it's much, much more difficult and frankly unfair to her mm -hmm. uh, in many ways. And so I just think that getting uh, getting far fast is going you know, to what's if we change the culture. You, you mm -hmm. need numbers. It's a great point, Jim. And I think, in all honesty, there's going to be a lot of noise around the, the Atlantic article, but that's the bottom line of it. Is if you get enough, if you close the leadership gap, you get enough diverse perspectives with a voice in leadership, mm -hmm. a lot of these other issues that we have talked about for years will start to change. We're at the, the uh, close of our allotted time, so I think we've had a great discussion around some things that or in the CED report around how to, what are the levers we can pull. One is greater transparency, whether it's a reporter explained, but it's a voluntary transparency. If we can get investors to care once things become more transparent, that will be extraordinarily helpful. Sponsorship, how do we get more senior women visibility to be on boards and to then give visibility to the supply? And finally, how do we highlight the competition that exists that can stimulate demand and if the U.S. doesn't come along, other countries clearly will pull on the supply that we know is there. So thank you all for, for coming, and uh, I'll let you close. And we're saying to give our panel a great round of that, that really was a terrific conversation. I want to thank uh, everybody for being here and, and, uh, and also thank the panel. This was a much more hopeful um, conversation than the first one we had about a year ago when we started this project. <laughs> and I have to say, um, uh, maybe we're at a breakthrough moment when the market is beginning to move in the right direction. Uh, it's still the case that we need to push and, uh, and push hard, even if the door is opening a little bit. And CED is uh, committed to uh, continuing to push this issue, to take the report uh, as far as we can and make sure uh, everybody in our network is aware of it, and I'm sure that all of you uh, we'll do the same. I, I was given uh, this. This is a uh, USB uh, piece that's right outside the door that has uh, the report on it. The report's also on the web, so uh, go ahead and download it. And it just remains to thank all of you. Thank Beth, the panel, and uh, Jim Turley. Thank you very much.